Well, could I invite uh, you to turn with me in the, your Bibles? Uh, the, you'll find a pew Bible in the, the pew in front of you there to Genesis chapter 18. Um, I can't see on the screen what page it is, but I know it's not 979. Um, page uh, 17 in, in, in the pew Bibles. Uh, and we're reading from verse 1. So Genesis chapter 18, and we're reading from verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. And Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them, and he bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so that you can be refreshed, and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seas of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf, and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared, and he set these before them. And while they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? they asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was already behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out, and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, Yes, you did laugh. Amen. We know this to be true. Let me pray. Father, we, we, uh, after the reading of your word, we submit ourselves to it. We ask, Lord, that the seed of your word sown among us uh, as we study together would, would take a deep root in our hearts, bringing forth much fruit as your heavenly wisdom would appoint. Speak, O Lord, and let us hear the very ministry of Jesus to us. In his name we ask. Amen. Amen. Whenever I read that passage, or, or, or any passage really in the Old Testament that describes hospitality, I always think of visiting my granny on the Shankill Road. It was impossible to go to my granny's house and not have something to eat. It didn't matter if you'd already had your lunch or if you had your dinner, and whether or not you were hungry did not come into the equation. You could not have visited my granny without the Vita loaf with cheese slices coming out or corned beef sandwiches and a pot of tea. No amount of objection would work because you would not get a dry visit, as she called it. Does anybody have a granny like that? You see, hospitality was important to a Shankill Road pensioner. But more so when we read the Old Testament, hospitality, and especially hospitality to strangers, to a Bedouin nomad such as Abraham, was of vital importance. But we see in this text, Genesis 18, as we, as we read it together, so Abraham receives these three visitors, they're, they're, they're strangers to him, and it's, we're not long into the text before we realize that something far more important uh, is happening here, and Abraham seems to grasp that this is no ordinary visit. Now, now, just as we begin to look at it, let me give you three things 
that we can consider as we, as we make our way through, through the text. Now, I'm going to mention three headings. They are God draws close to us, God speaks to us, and God does what is impossible to us. Okay, so God draws close, God speaks, and God does the impossible. Okay, so that, that's where we're going. Now, the hospitality of the day, we're in Genesis 18, hospitality of the day set a very high bar for making your guests feel welcome, and, and even strangers, as we can see. Middle Eastern hospitality, even today, it, it is of very high importance, maybe even more so than Shankill Road pensioners. But we're, we're not to miss the fact when we read in the New Testament that hospitality for Christians um, is also of high importance. The author of Hebrews reminds us, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels and not known it. And it appears from this text, Genesis 18, contained within this usual high demand for hospitality to strangers, Abraham becomes aware that these are no ordinary strangers that he was possibly entertaining angels. L l listen to the verbs that describe how Abraham responds. When he saw them, he hurried. Abraham hurried into his tent. He, he ran to the, the herd. We, we see this great man, Abraham, of such high importance in, in, in society. He seems to be in a bit of a flap. Okay, there, there, there's a frenetic energy to the text, and it's probably because he recognizes something about these three visitors. And so we're not long into the text before we discover what he sees because we read in verse 13, the Lord speaks to Abraham. One of these strangers, the Lord speaks to Abraham. So two of them are undoubtedly angels. One of them is the Lord God himself in human form. It's what we call a Christophany, an appearance of the sun in the Old Testament. So, so three strangers rock up to Abraham's tent in the heat of the day. They've got dusty feet and empty bellies. And we realize that these are heavenly envoys. These are divine emissaries. And so we see that water is brought out to wash their feet. Meat, bread, and curds are given to them as a meal. And we see these three strangers, these heavenly envoys, sitting under the shade of a tree, eating and drinking and resting from the heat. Now, I want to I just sit and pause here for, for a second. Um, Chloe uh, it has been taking our children through children's addresses uh, in a little series called Meals with Jesus. And we've seen Jesus uh, sitting down to eat with Levi and Zacchaeus and Mary and Martha, and we've seen Jesus feeding the, the, the large crowd. And I want to suggest, isn't it just a marvelous thought to think of Jesus in the New Testament, the holy God of heaven himself, completely familiar with all the, the glories of heaven, and we read about him sitting down with people over something as ordinary and intimate as a meal. Something as normal, something as, as humanly essential as eating food together. It's quite an amazing thought. But here we see in the Old Testament, Genesis 18, we see the Son, the, the second person of the Trinity, the Lord God in Genesis 18. He's sitting under a tree. He's enjoying the cool of the shade and he's addressing the hunger of his belly and the thirst of his throat. Now, now, now we sang uh, at the beginning of our service. We, we used the words from Isaiah 40 in, in, in a call to worship and we, we asked these rhetorical questions. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who, who has numbered every grain of sand? Or, or who has possibly given counsel to the Lord? Who, who, who can teach the one who knows all things or who can fathom all his wondrous deeds? And, and there's no answer to that rhetorical question. We just say, well, behold our God. Nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. And, and in one sense, when we sing that, we're singing in worship about a God who is beyond our reach. It's a God we have no right to approach. It's a, a God we should never even expect to fathom or, 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 or understand. We can only adore 
in wonder from afar if we're worshipping correctly. If we're worshipping correctly, we, we bring into focus a God that is so holy and so just and so, so awesome that we realize that any religious attempts that we might want to make towards him seem very futile to us. And so they are. And you've heard me say this a number of times from the pulpit. Religion is man trying to reach up to God. R religion is, is us trying to close that gap with our efforts. But of course, we're not into religion in this church as far as that definition is concerned. We're into grace. I hope you're into grace. The gospel of grace, and we're reminded time and time again from the scriptures that the gospel of grace is not that we have to reach up, but that he reaches down. He comes to us. He stoops down to us. He humbles himself and he comes to us in grace. One author writes this, there is no heart so lowly he cannot enter. There is no home so humble he will not make himself a welcome inmate. There is no table so poorly provided that he will not sit, turning water into wine, multiplying loaves and fishes, and even converting a simple meal into a sacrament. And so here in this text, here's the Son, the second person of the Trinity, the Holy God himself, he's sitting under Abraham's tree and he's eating and drinking. So I would love for us to be in awe of something this morning. To be in real wonder that Jesus says to us, and we read this earlier, behold I stand at the door and knock and if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will eat with that person and they with me. The Lord Jesus, the holy God of heaven, is reaching down and is inviting you to eat with him this morning. At his table. His table of grace. God comes close to us. Could that be too wonderful to be true? Well, let's see. Back to Genesis 18. Uh, these three guests, they're, they're eating, and we see that Abraham is hovering close by like a waiter in a restaurant to see if they need anything. And then these strangers ask him, they say, where is your wife, Sarah? So, so oh, okay, they, they, they have knowledge of who Abraham and, and Sarah are. He might not know them, but they know Abraham and Sarah. But they they don't just know them by reputation. Notice he asks for Sarah, not Sarai. It was only the last chapter that Sarai had her name changed to Sarah, if we remember. So they don't only have a knowledge of who they are, they have a knowledge of the things that God has said to them. And then one of them says, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now what's happening here? God is speaking to them and he is addressing the inner, most deepest recesses of their hearts. It's very unlikely that Abraham and Sarah are still talking publicly about the promise of a son. Okay, they're, in their, they're in their hundreds. It's not something you would naturally say to a couple who are in their hundreds. Maybe a newlywed couple. Next year you're going to have a child. But this stranger, he's speaking to them about a promise that they have from God that they probably have kept hidden for a long time and that they might have outright have given up on. There's a story about a preacher. He was, uh, went to the door after the service. He was shaking hands with people. And one of the, the, the ladies in the congregation said to him, that was a wonderful sermon this morning, thank you so much. Uh, it felt like you were speaking directly to me. And the minister said, well, madam, that wasn't me, that was the Holy Spirit. And she said, well, I'm not saying it was that good. 
But it's a wonderful thought, isn't it? It's a wonderful thought that when we gather together in this place, and we gather in Christ's name, the Bible says there he is in the midst of us. And that through the singing of good theology, through corporate prayer, through the public reading of his word, through the, the preaching and expounding of his word, we believe that by his Holy Spirit, God speaks to us. I heard a preacher say recently, someone called at his door late at night, got him out of the bath actually, and he answered the door and the man was standing there and he demanded that the minister give him back his diary. He said, how have you got a copy of my diary? And of course the preacher hadn't seen his diary. The preacher wasn't even thinking about the man when he preached, but what was happening was that the Lord God was speaking to that man into the innermost, deepest recesses of his heart through the preaching of the word. The man was being spoken to by Jesus. You see, above my head in, in, in the stained glass window there, right in the center is the Presbyterian emblem, the burning bush. You'll see it etched on the doors as well as you come in, that's the Presbyterian emblem. It's a reference to the time God spoke to Moses through the burning bush. It's the time when God revealed to Moses who he was. And it's a reminder that we believe, part of our reformed belief is that God still speaks through his word. And so what an amazing thought that is. It's why the the author of Hebrews warns us today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Can I say to you, there's no more uncomfortable place to be as a Christian. There's no quicker way to rob yourself of peace as a Christian than to hear God speak to you and harden your heart against it. So God comes close, God speaks, and lastly, God does what is impossible for us. Look at the text with me again. You'll see in verse 12 just how Abraham and Sarah see themselves. Okay, so we, we, we see in this text that Sarah laughs to herself, and she says, I am worn out. Okay, that's a term used for clothing that is done, stretched and, uh, and worn thin. I am worn out, uh, and Abraham is old, she says. And so we can see from what she's thinking about herself that even, even after everything that has happened here, even after all the affirmations and assurances that God has made about his covenant promises, Sarah laughs in her heart. And it's not a nice laugh, by the way. It's a, it's, it's a laugh of derision. Okay, it's a laugh that says, what a load of nonsense the promise of a son is. I am worn out, Abraham is old, and here this stranger speaks to something that they seemingly no longer believe is possible for them. And as I said, it's possibly something they haven't spoken to each other about for a long time. Now, why would Sarah laugh? Why would she laugh with derision? Well, because Sarah still thinks deep down that God is only capable of doing what she is capable of doing. She is limited to thinking that God is limited by her limitations. And if we do the same, if we limit God's promises to us this morning, to our own abilities, then we might say things like, well, could God really forgive me? If other people can't forgive me, if I can't even forgive myself, how could God forgive me? Or, or we might say, well, can God really call me righteous? when I know that I'm completely incapable of being righteous. You see, if we add our abilities 
And if we add our capabilities into the gospel promises, we're always going to come up short. But God asks a rhetorical question. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Actually, this could be translated from the Hebrew as, is there anything too wonderful for the Lord? You know, it might, it might be it might be this morning that you haven't you haven't accepted Christ into your life. It might be you haven't taken hold of, of Christ's offer for grace yet, and it might not be because you don't believe it intellectually. It might be because you think it's too wonderful for you. There are lots of things impossible for us. But is there anything impossible for the Lord? There are lots of things too wonderful for us. But is there anything too wonderful for the Lord? Sarah is going to learn here in this text, this amazing lesson, that God's promise of a son is not dependent on her natural ability to produce one. And you might be sitting thinking this morning, and you're thinking in your terms of your own ability, and you might think this about yourself. You might think, I'm not good enough to take communion after what I've done this week. When you take a look at my past, when you, when you consider the sins that I struggle with, when I take a look at who I am and what I'm capable of, I'm not good enough to take communion. Can I say something? You're right. You're not. None of us are. How could anybody possibly be good enough to dine with the Lord? Can I go even further this morning and say, if you do think you're good enough to take communion, can I recommend you just let the plate pass you by? Because this table has not been prepared by Jesus for self-righteous people. This table has not been prepared for for people who think they've managed somehow to, to bridge that gap between them and a holy God through their own efforts or through their own ability. This table this morning has been prepared by Jesus for those of us who are in wonder and amazement that God would stoop down to me. That he would knock on the door of my heart and he would offer to eat with me. This table is for people who are in wonder of that. Is there anything too wonderful for the Lord? This is a table that has been prepared by Jesus for those of us who consider the sacrifices of Calvary too wonderful to apply to them. But is anything too wonderful for the Lord? No. So today, can I say, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Because Jesus says he stands at the door and he knocks. And if anyone hears my voice, he says, and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with that person and they with me. So we're going to approach the table And as we do that, we're going to sing a hymn that includes these words. Turn your eyes to his table. It's prepared by his wonderful grace. Where we lay down our strength and our righteousness. And we rest in his mercy and grace. Let's stand together and we'll sing that and we'll approach the table together.